Mitochondrial dysfunction is associated with a million different diseases. I mean, just about every disease you can think of. You've got too much deuterium in your lungs and you get a massive virus infection because of that, because the deuterium is going to mess up the mitochondria of the immune cells so they can't clear the virus. It also messes up the uh, lysosome. So they end up with uh, immune cells that are sick and then the virus is free to multiply like crazy. So by building this exclusion zone water layer, aligning uh, the, the, uh, the gut, you're protecting, and also from even bacteria, it, it excludes everything. So the bacteria have a hard time getting in when there's that, that gel is in the way. That gel is maintained by the heparin sulfate and the heparin sulfate is severely deficient in association with autism. So, so you can make cholesterol sulfate which you can just throw out into the blood. If you're a cell in the skin, they make cholesterol sulfate in response to sunlight, and then they shed it. Then they dump the cholesterol sulfate into the blood and the HDL particles pick it up in their membrane with the sulfate sticking out. And that makes the HDL particles negatively charged, which keeps them from glomming together. So when you have, it actually builds a gelled water layer around the lipid particle which protects it from oxidation damage and glycation damage. I've been fascinated for a long time about why methylation pathways are so important to the biology. You know, I was puzzled by that. Why are they so important? And I believe I figured it out. And it's extremely interesting because Hello and welcome. I'm Sarah. And today I have the pleasure of Dr. Stephanie Seneff back on the channel. Dr. Seneff is a senior research scientist at the MIT Institute, and she's published over 350 papers on a variety of subjects. In this interview, Dr. Seneff was very generous with her time and information, and we discussed topics such as methylation pathways, deuterium, the role of the gut microbiome in producing deuterium-depleted methyl groups, and other important interactions and reactions. We discussed supplements and synthetic forms of vitamins and minerals. And we also highlight and talk about the importance of natural forms of nutrients, such as melatonin and methionine. Dr. Sedef is an expert on glyphosate. So we discuss the variety of ways in which it disrupts enzymes, biological pathways in the body, and how this is implicated in so many different diseases with more being added to the list. As you may know, Dr. Seneff has published a book on autism. So we discussed this in detail, especially the idea that autism can be in certain circumstances reversed. And Dr. Seneff introduces this idea of the brain being in hibernation. We also take a deep dive into deuterium and its role in mitochondrial dysfunction. We come back to how the gut microbiome process and uses deuterium. And we discuss how there are intricate processes in the body to make sure that deuterium-free protons or just protons get into the mitochondria. I want to thank for my sponsor, Lightwater Scientific, who helped me deliver free valuable information to you and also allow me to have great guests on this channel. Lightwater Scientific produced the purest and most deuterium-depleted water in the world. Depleting or lowering your deuterium has numerous health benefits from better metabolic health, more energy, greater resilience, less brain fog, increased physical performance, enhanced healing, and healthier mitochondria. Deuterium is an isotope of hydrogen, also known as heavy water, because it's bigger and heavier than regular hydrogen. Even though deuterium makes up only 0.02% of hydrogen, it's found everywhere. Deuterium is a burden to your body because it interferes with the intricate chemical reactions that occur by slowing them down. Deuterium is kryptonite to your mitochondria, and we need healthy mitochondria to produce energy. There's over 60 years of scientific research on the negative effects of too much deuterium on health, and also the positive benefits of lowering deuterium in the body. Light water, deuterium depleted water is 100% safe and non-toxic. In fact, it's the closest in structure to the metabolic water that your mitochondria produce. Light water, deuterium depleted water comes in five or 10 parts per million glass or plastic bottles, so level up your health by leveling down your deuterium today. The purchase link is in the show notes and use code Dr. Sarah for a discount off your order. Thank you for coming back, Dr. Senef. And we just had a brief little chat that nearly turned into a podcast. So, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so that people can understand why we're so excited about what we're going to talk about and how there's lots of new stuff. I think we ended the last podcast, we were talking about methyl groups. And then I just was chatting with you saying, I'm really concerned about methylated um, sort of supplements and how methyl 
these deuterated methyl groups might stick to DNA. And then I'll just hand the floor over to you because it's like <laughs> a massive topic that a lot of people need to learn about. Yes, it's it's truly amazing. And I'm just so excited about the research that we're doing. I'm collaborating with a great team and we're all just we're just storming with all kinds of ideas and each one is trying to figure out how the other one fits into their story. It's just an amazing time for us. We're having a great time with this very difficult puzzle that we're trying to figure out. And it's, I'm super excited. I can't tell you how excited I am about beginning finally to understand and pull it all together. Um, all of it really, I think it's, um, and I will give the short answer, which is that methylation pathways are very important. As you know, like autistic kids have, you know, defective methylation pathways. It's the B vitamins that make that happen. They're deficient, all these things. Um, I, I've been fascinated for a long time about why methylation pathways are so important to the biology. You know, I was puzzled by that. Why are they so important? And I believe I figured it out. And it's extremely interesting because the methyls, uh, the, the, the gut microbes play a central role in providing, meth methyl is CH3. So methane, you know about methane, that's CH4, right? I'm going to get right into the meat here because this part is really central. <laughs> Methane is CH4. The cows make too much methane gas. It's bad for the climate, so they're killing all the cows. I mean, you've probably heard about that, right? Um, so the gut microbes need to make methane in order to grab deuterium-depleted protons. And deuterium is heavy hydrogen. So, so listen carefully here, because this is really central. Hydrogen is a natural, you know, smallest atom, one proton, one electron. For anybody who knows anything about chemistry, you know that, right? Up, upper left-hand corner of the periodic table. And deuterium is, is also a kind of a hydrogen atom, except it has an extra neutron. It's a natural isotope of hydrogen, just like carbon-14. You've heard about carbon-14, which they used to trace, you know, his, get dating on carbon-14 dating, because you have carbon-12 and then you have carbon-14, which is an extra couple of neutrons making it heavier. And so, but with deuterium, it's a big change between hydrogen and deuterium because it's twice as heavy as hydrogen. Since hydrogen only has one elect, uh, proton, and then the, uh, the neutron is just as heavy as the proton. So the germ is twice as heavy. And that, and it's also bigger, of course, it's twice as big, twice as heavy. So it doesn't fit in right in all the places where hydrogen is used. And hydrogen is all over the place in, in metabolism. I and mean, it's key to metabolism. Everything is about hydrogen and oxygen and exchanging those things, you know, moving these guys around, making the molecules. All of that involves hydrogen. You don't ever have a reaction practically without hydrogen being involved. So it's very important. And then the thing that's really interesting is that the mitochondria, they're, of course, the workhorses of the body that make the, make the energy for the cell in the form of ATP. They have the citric acid cycle, which turns the uh, all the nutrients, but glucose, for example, into carbon dioxide and water, the famous sort of oxidative phosphorylation, you know, that makes energy out of, out of sugar, for example, um, and also makes carbon dioxide and water in the process, right? That's sort of what the mitochondria do as their way of making the, uh, the ATP molecules that then supply energy to the cell. So it's super important. Mitochondrial dysfunction is associated with a million different diseases. I mean, just about every disease you can think of has a correlation with mitochondrial dysfunction, meaning that the mitochondria are sick. And they're sick because they're spewing out, their evidence of them being sick is that they're spewing out these reactive oxygen species that are then gonna cause DNA damage. You know, and then you're gonna end up with cancer eventually if that keeps up. And they're, not, they're inefficient at making the ATP. And what a big thing that can cause them to behave like that is too much deuterium, too much deuterium in the mitochondria. And the metabolism knows that. So biology has sort of evolved to be incredibly sophisticated at making sure to deliver protons to the mitochondria that are not deuterons. Deuterons and protons are the, are the positively charged correspondence to the hydrogen and deut deuterium. So deuterium plus, you know, missing the electron is a deuteron and then hydrogen plus H plus missing the electron is called a proton. So just for the terminology there. And so you want the mitochondria to be populated with lots of protons. They're actually proton motive force is what drives the production of ATP. So you pump these protons into the membrane, into the stuff, the, the space inside this double membrane. And then the protons naturally come back out through the gradient. And they're gonna come back out and they come back out through these ATPase pumps. There's, there's millions of these pumps in every mitochondria. There's tons of these ATPase pumps. Those are en enzymes. And those pumps hate deuterium. Deuterium basically kind of clogs them up like sugar in the gas tank. They really don't want deuterium. It'll kill them. And it'll cause them to become inefficient and, and, and mess things up because it's too big, because it, it, it holds on too hard. 
it, it stays attached to the to the molecule that it's on tightly because it's twice as heavy as hydrogen. So it misbehaves in every situation where hydrogen is needed in the reaction, deuterium will behave differently. And biology has taken advantage of that to figure out how to design enzymes that can say, no, no, I won't do it. Here's a, a, a substrate and it's got hydrogen on it. And, my, and, my, and I'm an enzyme and my job, one of my jobs is to take a hydrogen off of that substrate. And there are enzymes that will, if that, if that particular molecule has a deuterium substituting for that particular hydrogen that you want to take off, there are enzymes that won't touch it. Like that particular version of glucose, let's say, with a, pro with a deuterium there instead of hydrogen, then the reaction that wants to take it off won't do it because it's uh, very skilled at only working if it's hydrogen. And that's how you can end up with products that are depleted in deuterium because all the, all the original molecules that have a deuterium, they won't, won't react. They'll just stay what, as they were. They won't react. So that it's a very complicated system with all kinds of fascinating uh, subtopics within it that I'm just beginning to tap the, into. And it's just really fun to sort of look at all the different papers that I've read before in the context of this story about deuterium, to put that on top of it, and then to understand why it is the way it is. It's really, really interesting. Oh, definitely. Because also back to the periodic table, um, technically hydrogen's a metal if you look because it's in group one. So mm. it is deuterium is king of the heavy metals yet. That's interesting. Uh, That's a good way to look at it. I never thought of that. Wow. That's really nice. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So um, um, because, again, it's got different properties and in some ways it's sort of more sticky. If we loop back to the deuterium in a methyl group, how would you say that that could, could be a problem and could it stick to DNA and cause hypermethylation, which we know is like a cause of aging from, you know, studies on astronauts and other sort of aspects of aging? Yeah, it's really, uh, it, well, it's very interesting, the methyls. And I didn't tell the com complete story there because I kind of dropped off when I talked about the methane gas and the cows, right? I kind of dropped that off. So let me go back to that because that's super important. The bacteria in your gut, as we know, the bacteria in your gut do a a ton of things for the host that the host cells can't do. And one of the things they do is they make hydrogen gas. They make it from organic molecules. So I could have glucose and I could have a pro proton stuck to the glucose and I have an enzyme. I'm, I'm, I'm a microbe. I have an enzyme. I can take that proton off. I can take off a couple of protons, put them together and make hydrogen gas, H2. And the gut microbes do that. We know that, you know, they make H2, hydrogen gas. And that gas uh, if you just, uh, if it's a gas, it's just going to escape if you don't do something with it, right? So they have to grab it and do something else, which what happens is there's these other microbes called methanogens. They take that hydrogen gas and they take carbon dioxide and they kind of do, and then they take those, put those two together and they make methane. So carbon dioxide is CO2, carbon with a couple of oxygens. These enzymes take the two oxygens off and replace them with four hydrogens that came from hydrogen gas. So you sort of two H2 plus CO2 becomes CH4, <laughs> CH4 plus uh, H2O, I think. So it's probably just, you know, it's kind of the reverse of what we do in our mitochondria, where we take the organic matter and turn it into carbon dioxide and water. We, we do water, but this one is carbon dioxide and hydrogen gas. So it's a little bit different, right? It's hydrogen gas. And that's really important because the hydrogen gas that the microbes make is severely depleted in deuterium. And that is truly, truly amazing. And it makes sense because deuterium likes to stay in the liquid phase. The deuterium likes to stick to the molecule. So, and, and the enzyme specializes in not, not choosing deuterium through its very interesting biophysical properties. So all of that conspires to produce hydrogen gas that's got 80% of its deuterium gone. And that is really, really important to the biology because now you've got methane, CH4, with 80% of the deuterium gone. That methane is extremely valuable to the organism, extremely valuable. And the organism pays really good attention to it and passes it around among all these molecules, you know, like even attaching it to DNA, making choline out of it, making uh, melatonin out of it, all these different things. They're grabbing these methyl groups. Of course, it starts with methionine. Methionine is the universal methyl donor. And the gut microbes make the methionine. We can't make the methionine. They make it out of this methane that came from the hydrogen that has the really low deuterium. So the methionine has this S methyl group that if anyone knows anything about methylation pathways, they know methionine has that methyl that it ends up putting on to tetrahydrofolate uh, to make methyl tetrahydrofolate. And then that guy passes it around to all these different places, the DNA methylation, protein methylation, all these places and making choline. So all these uh, nutrients that are really um, healthy 
uh, have these methyls, but you can trace them back to the methane, to the hydrogen, and therefore they are low in deuterium. 20, uh, only 20% 20 of what a normal molecule would have. Huge reduction in deuterium. So that's a giant step towards keeping the mitochondria healthy. And that's why, I think that's the primary reason why the methylation pathways are so important because the body keeps track of those methyls and eventually delivers them to the mitochondria and they get broken down and turned into carbon dioxide again, you know, basically carbon dioxide and water. But in the process, they're delivering uh, high quality protons to the mitochondria. But also the good thing about this is it's um, a symbiotic system and deuterium isn't evil because something with a short life cycle, like a fly or a bacterium loves deuterium, uh, uh, sorry, like a, yeah, loves deuterium, like a bacterium, it loves deuterium because it, it makes it grow quicker. So the bacteria use deuterium themselves because they don't, their ATPases is work. Well, they don't have, they have something different, but a deuterium actually is totally compatible with them. So nature's built in this unique system for they have the deuterium and they like it and it keeps it, us, it away from us. Exactly. That's an extremely good point because, and in fact, even the viruses, they trap deuterium, uh, the, the uh, COVID virus mm. uh, traps, the SARS-CoV-2 traps deuterium in its RNA. Now, I think the viruses play a role in pulling deuterium out of the liquid. Like for example, in the lungs, you've got too much deuterium in your lungs and you get a massive virus infection because of that, because the deuterium is gonna mess up the mitochondria of the immune cells, so they can't clear the virus. It also messes up the uh, lysosomes. So they end up with uh, the immune cells that are sick, and then the virus is free to multiply like crazy. But in doing so, it's trapping deuterium, which is making the lungs healthier because it's removing deuterium from the lungs water. It's really, really fascinating. So I think, in fact, I think maybe all viruses, I, I, find, I get these ideas and then I sort of generalize them in a grand way. <laughs> But I think maybe all viruses play a role in helping to maintain low deuterium in the mitochondria. I'll go out on a limb and say that, you know. You know that's that's really interesting because actually one way to deplete deuterium is you know when you get snotty or cough up stuff. That's a very that's a deuterium depleting pathway, same as any you know excreting anything like sweating or you know going to the bathroom as well. So that's right. Uh, yes. And as I mentioned this uh, to you earlier, the salivary glands that know how to excrete water that's concentrated in deuterium. So they help to remove the deuterium out of the body, putting it into the gut. I mean, it's, you know, sometimes people used to sort of spit all the time. And in a way, it makes sense because you're losing deuterium by spitting because the, the saliva will be more concentrated in deuterium because it came from those, the work of those salivary glands to release water that's rich in deuterium. That, that's really interesting because when it comes to deuterium testing, which is the current bottleneck for moving this, because this field is like massively important and it's constantly trying to be stuffed under the carpet by, we won't go into who, but that <laughs> would be a way to like um, expose how much deuterium there actually are in people because nobody gets tests. I mean, I've, like I was telling you earlier, ordered two for, for two clients and it came back sort of 148. So, you know, there's, and that they sort of living healthily uh, as you would expect. So, so it's going to be this thing that if we did mass testing, um, a lot of dirty laundries coming out. So maybe if you could talk about different tests, because I know you can do breath, you can do urine, you can do saliva, and how accurate are they? And what's the best way to test people and food and products? Yeah, it's it's actually quite challenging. And, then, and uh, so what I've, I've learned is that the blood, so the blood has sort of an intermediate level of deuterium in it. Breast milk has low deuterium, which is quite interesting. So when the mother's making milk for the baby, she wants to give that baby less deuterium. So breast milk is a good source. It's a good food source, milk in general, and, and butter in particular. Butter comes from, butter has butyrate and butyrate is made from two acetate molecules. And the acetates come from those methanes. <laughs> Originally, you trace them back to the hydrogen gas. So they're gonna be low in deuterium. Butyrate is a food that the, that the colonocytes lining the colon, they love butyrate. That's their favorite food. And the microbes make it for them. And they make it from the roughage, for example, as well. They make it from, they can make it from lots of things, but it comes, if you get the two acetates, say so the acetogens make acetate, and then there's other microbes that turn the acetate into butyrate. And these microbes like an acidic environment, they're acid loving bacteria. Glyphosate raises the pH of the gut, messing them up. And so people have shown experimentally that there's low acetate and, and high pH in the gut as a consequence of glyphosate. They've done studies on rats that show that it's messing up the ability to make the acetate. 
and therefore to make the butyrate because butyrate needs the low pH. And then when there's not enough butyrate, the gut gets sick because those uh, colonocytes are not getting a healthy fuel. So butyrate, which is in butter, is low in deuterium. And butter is a fantastic food as far as deuterium is concerned, one of the lowest in deuterium. So you can certainly improve your deuterium situation and reduce your deuterium exposure by eating um, fats, actually. Animal-based fats in particular are typically low in deuterium. And that is, again, because they come from this acetate that came from this, these uh, hydrogen gas in the gut. So the gut microbes are making these really wonderful foods for the host that are derived from that hydrogen gas that starts with 80% reduction in deuterium. So they're trying to hang on to that with, and, and keep track of those particular molecules that have that low deuterium and then to funnel them into the mitochondria to keep them healthy. That's sort of a whole system of, meta of metabolism that goes on. So did I get off track there? I think we had a question. Oh, that no, I didn't it's answer. fine. <laughs> Every time you say something, it just triggers another thought because looping back to the roughage and the fiber and foods, because obviously fruit's high in deuterium, but that's sort of for a reason because it's of deuterium's a growth factor as well. Mm -hmm. And then fruit obviously is comes out in mating season time when animals or people evolutionarily would be gaining weight so i can understand that but then when it comes to vegetables and things it are they low in deuterium or high in deuterium because some people say onions and garlic are deuterium bombs and i think beans are but nuts aren't so right what do you yeah. know about like other deuterium yeah. foods i my impression is that it's really the fats that are going to give you the low deuterium mm -hmm. and pretty much that's it like everything else is going to be either sort of average or high. And I think the sugars are high. Mm. Well, I'm not sure of that, but the fats are low, definitely low. And they're substantially lower. Like you can get, so it's 155 parts per million in seawater is sort of the standard typical level of deuterium, 155 parts per million, 155 deuterium atoms for every million hydrogen atoms. And that sounds like a really small number, but it's not because the level of deuterium in the blood is like five times as much as the level of calcium. Thinking of it as like a mineral or like a a metal, you know, you mentioned that that's in the same periodic table channel as the metals are, which is quite interesting to think of it as a metal and, and perhaps as a toxic metal. But the thing is, deuterium actually has, just like iron, it has both a good side and a bad side. And the body is able to basically separate the deuterium out. So the body concentrates the deuterium in the gelled water. And, and then it, and that results in low deuterium in the fluid water. So if you think of the blood, in the vasculature, it's, it's lined with gelled water. And that gel is maintained by the collagen and all these, you know, collagen is the most common protein in the body. Something like 30% of our proteins are collagen molecules. And collagen lasts a long time, typically. It's pretty sturdy. And collagen um, makes it, the collagen network with the, with the sulfates, you know, there's sort of this whole complicated sugars, the heparin sulfate sugars that are attached that whole network makes jello. It basically makes jello. Like, you know, jello has a lot of uh, fragments of collagen. That's what makes it when you put the jello powder into the water and you let it freeze and it gets really hard. That's mostly water, but it's very stiff. So it's almost, I call it liquid ice. Gelled water is, is like liquid ice. And interestingly, ice traps deuterium. So when, the, when you get the glacier melt, that's a low deuterium source of water. So people sell glacier water on the, on the web and I think the health of glacier water is, is related to the fact that the deuterium levels are low. They can be as low as 90 parts per million compared to 155 in seawater. So that's a big difference. So one way to get low deuterium would be to drink. Uh, this actually is deuterium depleted water right here. <laughs> so I drink it every day. You can, you can make um, deuterium depleted water like I do sometimes, like you freeze it, throw away the ice and keep the water and just keep doing it. But nobody. Exactly. I think that, that's said it's like two to five percent you can lose with each freeze well freezing cycle you might, have yes. to, might have to do it 10 times it's a lot of you have to have a lot of patience to make the water that way and of course you can buy this light water product which is what i do yeah uh, it's very expensive to make and, and very expensive to buy it feels crazy you know spending on water what you would spend on a good wine you know it's really very expensive water i consider it to be worth it so i've been taking light water for many for a long time years actually so um, I really believe in it. And um, it, it's a way to get a low deuterium source. But on the other hand, it's not necessarily the case that, uh, well, I guess the levels of deuterium on the earth have actually been going up, I believe, over time. So you could say that we're getting more poisoned by it. But, but deuterium has a good side because it goes into these 
the gelled water and it actually makes the gel stiffer. So it, it helps to make the gelled water, which is, which is good stuff. Like most of our bodies gel, the water, we have a lot of water in our body. And most of it is gelled water. We have to do this tricky thing to keep the blood flowing because you don't want to gel the blood, right? If you gel the entire blood, you're going to shut down your circulation. So there's lots of intricacies that go into managing the blood to keep a gel along the surface of the blood vessel, but then to still allow the free flowing water to go inside the blood vessel. It's a tricky thing to do. And that's something that biology has figured out, of course, because it's figured out everything. <laughs> it knows how to, it's constantly titrating the, the blood. And it actually, I think it's using nitrate and sulfate back and forth. It's got intricate um, procedures to do signaling to say, oh, I need nitrate. Oh, I need sulfate. Because nitrate will make the water flow freely. The, it, these, these are things called chaotropes and co cosmotropes. They're part, part of the Hofmeister series. This is a whole bi biophysics thing. Oh, yes, um, I used to use those. I used to do protein folding. So um, sulfate's um, a, a cosmotrope and urea is a ke yeah, a chaotrope. Exactly, exactly. Yes, and urea, of course, has a lot of nitrogen. So nitrates, nitrate is a chaotrope and sulfate is a cosmotrope. Cosmotropes gel the water. Nit uh, chaotropes make the water soft you know, and fluid. And, uh, and the endothelial cells lining the blood vessels are constantly watching to see how the blood's flowing. And they can tell that from the electromagnetic signal that's created by the red blood cells as they go by, because the red blood cells are negatively charged particles in an electric field. They send out a signal, an electromagnetic signal that the endothelial cells can receive and act on. And it's really fascinating because when the red blood cells are moving fast, that says, oh yeah, we got plenty of fluid, no problem. We don't need more nitrate. We need, we need sulfate maybe to slow it down a bit. You know, So you're constantly going back and forth between the sulfate and the nitrate. And the endothelial cells know how to watch that signal and then know how to react to keep all the blood everywhere in the body circulating properly with the right viscosity. You know, if your blood gets too viscous, you, you can end up, uh, you know, having a no flow situation. And then you're going to have organ damage because they're not getting oxygen. I mean, really serious things can happen when the, when the blood um, gels in a sense. And of course, you have all these blood clots and things that are going on right now that are related to that. The blood's not circulating properly. So it's really tricky to for the body to maintain all that free flowing water in the blood, while at the same time having gel almost everywhere else. Like the cells have a lot of gel inside them, you know. Um, it's, a, it's an intricate process of allowing the water to flow where it needs to flow. And that's in the lymph system as well, right? In the blood, in the lymph, the water needs to flow. But otherwise it can just sit there in the gel. And when it does that, you can trap deuterium in the gel. And then whatever fluid water you have in your cell, for example, it is going to be less deuterium because it's trapped in the gel. Oh, that's and I think the size, yeah. Go ahead. If, you, if you have more, say, exclusion zone or gel water, is that just a way of not depleting deuterium, just putting it somewhere where it can't? Trapping it, trapping it so that it will deplete it because what's left over in the fluid water is less because you've got it in the gel. You're grabbing the deuterium and trapping it in the gel so that the fluid water will have less. Oh, I see. And and just for people who are listening, when you were referring to the nitrogens or nitrates, do you are you meaning nitric oxide? Um, right. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. People are familiar with that again. Like yes. You know, so I, I just totally uh, love this idea of like the blood being magnetic and electric, and how we've got this um, talk between the sulfate and the nitrate to say faster or slower. Exactly. Uh, um, Again, uh, looping back to glyphosate, how how would glyphosate disturb this mechanism, or is it does it not penetrate into the blood enough, or does it? Oh, glyphosate's a mess, it, it absolute mess with regard to deuterium. I as soon as you know, so I only first became aware of deuterium's importance in biology in December of 2019. I remember it well, and you know Laszlo Boris. I think he's talked, he's done podcasts with you, right? Yes, he did. Or it was great. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's a cool guy. So he and I have become good friends and we're collaborating. We're trying to publish papers, which is super hard by the way, because our topics are so revolutionary that the mainstream doesn't know what to make of it. And they just basically bounce it without review in many cases. Very frustrating. Um, but we'll get there. I mean, we're really, we're on fire with regard to these papers and we're all trying to figure it out too, because we're still, it's still a story being told, you know, lots of it is still unclear to us, but we're, we're working really fast, I think, making a lot of headway. And with all these brilliant people collaborating and throwing ideas around, it's really like a wonderful stew that's going on right now that I'm really enjoying. It's been so, so marvelous. I love the science. I love puzzles. This is a fantastic puzzle. So it really keeps me going very happy actually in my work you know 
anyway, I got off on a tangent. But he told me, and just I, I, I had published a paper to get together with Greg Nye. He's another person who collaborates with me, Dr. Greg Nye, and he and I published a paper in the journal Water on on sulfate, on cobalamin, and on sort of this all these metabolic pathways that are related to cobalamin and sulfate, and explaining everything that's going on with the various dysfunctions that arise when cobalamin is deficient and how they all make sense in connecting with each other. So that was a fun paper. Oh, no, that, that sounds really good. For people listening, that's vitamin B12. Yes, right. B12. Yeah, so that's another thing. So this is all coming back again to the methylation cycle. So I'm really interested exactly. to hear, because yes. I'm really interested in B12 because I know that the receptor is very light active and obviously the, the cobalamin itself is gonna is a big fluorophore. So there's more now to this. So may, maybe if you pause on the cobalamin and deuterium and, and the paper, because that would be a really good topic. Right. Yes. I mean, that's just really, really interesting. And what was fun for us is that all the enzymes that cobalamin catalyzes, there's only a handful. But when you look at them all, you can kind of see how it all makes sense as far as what happens when cobalamin is deficient. And you actually get, uh, you can get really serious problems with the brain when cobalamin is deficient. You can have something that looks like Alzheimer's and it's just cobalamin deficiency. You can fix it by just fixing the cobalamin problem. Glyphosate messes up cobalamin. And we talked in the paper about how why that's true. But part of it is just cobalt. Glyphosate chelates cobalt. It, it grabs very tightly onto cobalt. And cobalamin is, is essentially the only enzyme, as far as I know, in the human in humans anyway, mm -hmm. that depends on cobalt as a catalyst. And then glyphosate also messes up the enzymes that make the, the cobalamin's uh, ring. It has this um, pyrrole ring that it, it just like heme. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it has this ring, and, and, and that ring depends upon glycine. Glycine is a, is a precursor, is a, a substrate to make the ring. And papers have shown that glyphosate disrupts the ability to make that ring that makes the cobalamin molecule. And of course, the gut microbes make the cobalamin for the host, and they get sick because glyphosate really messes them up. So they're not behaving well. They're not producing enough cobalamin, even as it is without those other problems with the glyphosate. And then cobalamin has a really difficult time being absorbed. It's very tricky because it has to be sort of bound to various... Uh, there's an intrinsic factor or something. There's something that the um, that the cells in the in the stomach uh, make this factor that helps cobalamin to usher it through the acidity of the stomach without it getting destroyed. And those uh, those stomach cells are going to be very badly affected by glyphosate because glyphosate really gets inside the cells easily in an acidic environment, and the stomach is very acidic. So the parietal cells in the stomach, which are the ones that produce this. I think it's called intrinsic factor that helps the cobalamin to make it through the stomach. Those cells get messed up by glyphosate. They can't do their job. And then the cobalamin can just get destroyed. And then of course, the absorbing co cobalamin is also tricky because it's a big molecule. So there's all these different ways in which glyphosate messes up cobalamin. So I think we have a systemic B12 deficiency in our society in the United States. We, by the way, have more glyphosate per person uh, here as used here in America than in any other country in the world. Um, we're, we're king of glyphosate. We love it. And, and we're poisoning ourselves, our, our foods. I mean, Zen Honeycutt's a friend of mine from Moms Across America. She's been doing interesting tests on food samples. She collected food samples from the school's lunches and tested them for glyphosate. And she tested just recently has new results on fast food. She got a lot of different food samples from various popular fast food uh, sto uh, shops, restaurants. And she found glyphosate in 100% of the fast foods and high levels in many of the foods. So we're being completely poisoned by glyphosate in this country, all of us. That's really interesting because a lot of people just think of plants and having glyphosate and, and you know, or it might be on leaves or um, soya or whatever. But the fact it's in sort of processed food, you wouldn't think, I mean, obviously processed food full of deuterium as well. So you've got like the double whammy. But I think that's a really important because I've had people to say, oh, no, well, I don't really eat that much, you know, fruit and vegetables. I'm not going to have glyphosate. But if it's absolutely loaded in unexpected produce, that's, again, all the more reason not to eat things like that. But it is really disturbing um that it's that it's there and i suppose children are eating it as well so i think it is is glyphosate more of a problem to an adult or a child because because children need more deuterium than we do because they're growing so yes it's a problem but not so much for adults is it the opposite way around with the glyphosate glyphosate is really hard on the children i think it's the primary cause of the autism epidemic in this country i'm almost certain that i'm right at this point i've been looking at that for a long long time i have my book toxic legacy i'll hold it up here 
Oh no, Halloween. That, it's really the book's really good. It, it's yeah. I, I've read it uh, uh, before, so there's good chapters in it, and and it's actually it's very lay person friendly as well. It's got a lot of biology in it, but it's, I tried to make it as simple as possible, and I tried to kind of usher the person along here and there, encouraging them to stay with me because it's hard, but. Parts of it are hard, but it's so, I mean, it's again, it's so fun. I just love the science. I, it's terrifying. I mean, I think if we keep it up with the glyphosate, we're going to, um, I think we're going to fail to reproduce at some point. We're going to basically shrink to zero at, if we keep it up like this. That we have to change our food system if we plan to have, if humans plan to be alive on this earth in a thousand years, we have to do something. I really believe that. We're, we're losing on fertility big time already, as you probably know. Sperm are sick and women have, uh, uh, polycystic ovary syndrome, P PCOS, that's one that's caused by glyphosate. That's associated, that's the biggest problem with uh, infertility in women and, and glyphosate causes that. So, I mean, we've got, and of course the kids are all getting autism, even in utero, they're already starting to, the, the brain's not developing correctly because their mother's being poisoned with glyphosate. And then the kids continue to get lots of glyphosate. A lot of them eat a lot of junk food, they're getting lots of glyphosate. And it's it's very clear to me how glyphosate causes autism. And I write a lot about that in my book. Very clear. I have no, no doubt. First of all, you say, because I think, because what you said about autism developing in the womb uh, is one really interesting aspect I've not heard, because I've heard lots of different other ideas about uh, you know immunization protocols and um all sorts of other toxic factors but if it actually starts before the baby's born is there well, the mother is getting vaccines as well right in, yeah. during pregnancy that's going to contribute i is mean i do think is that, that they even allowed <laughs> oh absolutely america's very fond of giving flu shots to, to, to pregnant women it's absolutely shocking to me that they think that's a good idea even the covid vaccine to, to pregnant women no problem i mean i'm just stunned that we're okay with that. I'm just stunned. I don't understand what's wrong with our government that they think these things are okay. So I will. <laughs> but do, do you think um, that, if, say if somebody did have children who were autistic, how, how far can you go to cure, well, sort of resolve it? Um, is it too late or are there things that you can do to rescue any of what's happened or is it something that um, you can't? That is an excellent question. And that's a question I had been asking for many years because I, I, I wanted to know and I didn't know, is it possible to reverse autism? That's the question. Is the brain permanently damaged or is it in some kind of hibernation state that it could actually recover from? That's the big question, right? Yeah, that's, and that's, a, hard, that's a hard question to answer. But I think the answer is yes, it can fully recover because I know people who have fully recovered from autism. It is so beautiful to see. I was so thrilled the first time I met a young woman. She was my 18-year-old uh, teenager and her mother they were at a, at a conference that I was at and they talked to me in private you know um during the breaks and and this she was lovely this 18 year old girl she seemed perfectly healthy she had been diagnosed with autism back when she was like six years old and her mother had put her on an organic diet of course stopped all the vaccines and um, did some other supplements you know the methylation pathways she basically cured her autism which was just so fantastic for me to see because that was sort of the first example that I met you know face to face very impressive. And I've heard other people say, um, you know, autism and, and people who treat autistic kids have been able to, you know, maybe it's most of the symptoms are, are relieved, but they might be a little quirky or something like that. But I think even completely reversed is possible. And I think that's a wonderful thing to know because you should never give up if you have an autistic child. Oh, you so that's what up. I was getting to, because say if somebody um, gave birth to a child with chap down syndrome, at least, you know, you can't do anything. You can't reverse that. So you accept it. Whereas with autism, I have friends and who who's spending thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars trying to fix it. And, 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 and that's why I asked it, because it might just be. And that thing you said about the brain being in hibernation, what, what would what does that mean? Because this is now delving kind of quite deep into consciousness and sort yeah. of. Yeah. I think hibernation is a lot of it, actually. And that again, I've been figuring this out. It's quite fascinating. It has to do with sulfur. And as you may know, I have a lot of interest in sulfur. I first identified autism as being a sulfur mismanagement problem, I would call it. They have trouble with sulfate. They don't have, they have insufficient sulfate and broken sulfate, sulfation pathways in autism. I think that's absolutely clear. And I learned about that from Rosemary Waring's work. Rosemary Waring was looking at autism back in the 1990s fascinating woman she had many autistic kids that she treated and she did a lot of analysis of their urine samples to see what's what's weird in the urine what's out of whack 
And she found something extraordinary, was that, which was the autistic kids had extremely high level, levels of sulfite and thiosulfate in their urine. Really, really high levels, like 50 times as much as what normal kids would have which indicated that they were having trouble with sulfation pathways, because those are sort of things that can become sulfate if you've got the enzymes working properly. And they also even dump sulfate into their urine, even though the sulfate in their blood is, is deficient. So it's really strange. They're flushing sulfate, even though they need it. But they, the reason is because they can't hook sulfate onto carrier molecules. The whole, uh, it's the sulfotransferases that are broken by glyphosate. And those are enzymes that take sulfate off of, there's this molecule called the universal sulfate donor, PAPS, P-A-P-S, it's phosphodenosyl phosphosulfate, P-A-P-S, a great molecule. That's just like methionine is a universal methyl donor. PAPS is the universal sulfur, sulfate donor. And then PAPS can be taken, so sulfate can be taken off of PAPS and stuck onto something else. And that something else is very interesting. It's usually a, a ring molecule, a molecule with carbon rings. And it includes major classes, for example, cholesterol, all the sterols, vitamin D, cholesterol, uh, the, the sex hormones, those are all one big class of molecules that are typically sulfated in transit. So you basically, uh, like you can make estrogen, and then you stick a sulfate on it. And like, for example, the adrenal glands, they're gonna make some hormones, uh, they, estrogen and, and um, testosterone. And of course the, uh, the sex glands, they're all gonna be making these hormones and they stick a sulfate on it and ship it out into the, into the blood to transport it to where it needs to go, for example, to the brain. And so the transport system for these ring molecules, they're, they're typically fat soluble and putting sulfate on them makes them water soluble. And that then you can just throw them out into the blood and let them go, including cholesterol. So you can make cholesterol sulfate, which you can just throw out into the blood. If you're a, a cell in the skin, they make cholesterol sulfate in response to sunlight and then they shed it. Then they dump the cholesterol sulfate into the blood and the HDL particles pick it up in their membrane with the sulfate sticking out. And that makes the HDL particles negatively charged, which keeps them from glomming together. So when you have, it actually builds a gelled water layer around the lipid particle, which protects it from oxidation damage and glycation damage. And that happens with the HDL and the LDL, all those particles, you know, you have high serum LDL, you get stuck on a statin drug. That's because your cholesterol sulfate sy synthesis system is broken by the glyphosate. You don't have enough cholesterol sulfate now you have to stick this cholesterol inside the lipid particle and the lipid particle doesn't have enough sulfate in its membrane. So it doesn't have very good gelled water around it. So now the sugar and the oxygen can attack it and then it becomes oxidized, it becomes glycated and then it gets stuck into the, into the blood vessels and you know, blocks the heart and all that kind of stuff. So it's because of the inability to add sulfate to cholesterol that you basically end up with heart disease. Oh, yeah, definitely. And also that just reminds me of something about, we know when people get lab test results and they've got super low HDL and it can indicate leaky gut, it, it, how, how does the HDL uh, link back into the gut? And, and th that um, this mark, marker, how does HDL relate to the gut? Because I know you talked about it before the gut. Type. Yeah, well, so it's just going to be that the HDL is, um, the, the liver can't make the HDL if it doesn't have enough sulfate. It's a sulfate deficiency problem that's driving all of this. The gut becomes unhealthy when there's not enough sulfate because the gut makes sulfated heparin sulfate in the gut. It lines all the gut and keeps it secure from heparin sulfate builds this sort of exclusion zone water. That's, uh, that's the gelled water that I talked about earlier in the gut. It's very important to have that gelled water in, on the interior of the gut to protect the colonocytes, for example, from again, from oxidative and glycation damage. So by building this exclusion zone water layer, uh, lining the the, uh, the gut, you're protecting, and also from even bacteria, it, it excludes everything. So the bacteria have a hard time getting in when there's that, that gel is in the way. That gel is maintained by the heparin sulfate, and the heparin sulfate is severely deficient in association with autism. So you get both the HDL particles and the gut lining depend upon the sulfate to be healthy. Oh, so I it's a sulfate deficiency that's causing everything. Yeah, I see. Because what I've learned of late is that every single lab result doesn't actually mean what we think it does. And therefore, yes, of course, you know, the low HDL is linked into also gut issues and autism, but it's actually coming from a sulfate problem. So then it all links back to, well, the sun, like you were saying, and the, and the cholesterol sulfate, but also other factors that are stealing sulfate, like like glyphosate so i just found yeah. that you know it's it's really nice sort of joining dots up because then you can help right. people with trying to interpret 
the labs they've got not to just keep getting more and more and more and more because very basic yes. labs will tell you uh, and straight away I think like you've said that if I now know oh a low HDL is a sulfate problem it now gives people um, sort of a route in order to how to fix it and then obviously HDL is we know is helpful but then it's a function of good sulfation in the body so I can see how it all is yeah, like because HDL actually, you know, it's interesting because the liver makes these, empty, these sort of empty shell HDL particles and then they go to the skin and they pick up the cholesterol sulfate in the skin, mm -hmm. the HDL particles they, they, in their membrane. It goes into their membrane. The sulfate is surrounding them. Sulfate's giving them the negative charge, giving them the gel, and now they're happy campers. And then they actually go to the LDL and they deliver stuff to the LDL. So the HDL particles are like, I, I think of them like the little boats that go to shore and pick up the goods and they take them to the big boat and the big boat is the ldl particle and they exchange goods you know and then they each make each, each other health happy with the balance between the cholesterol and the fats and everything they're basically the hdl is a little particle so we can go into uh, intricate places and pick things up whereas the ldl is bigger so it sort of has to kind of wait for the for the little boat to deliver to the to the ship you know kind of a metaphor which i like so um, there's a lot of exchanging going on between the hdl and the ldl particles they have like uh, so it's, uh, let's see if I can get this right. Um, cysteine and uh, homocysteine. I don't know if you heard about homocysteine. homocysteine. Oh, absolutely. I was going to ask you about that because that ties into weird methylation and high homocysteine is obviously a big cardiovascular risk. But yes, that's right. Absolutely. Thank you. I'm glad you know all of that because that's yeah. right. And that also goes back to sulfate because homocysteine is a source of sulfate. You can make sulfate from homocysteine. Mm -hmm. And, um, and homocysteine gets high because the methylation pathways are messed up, right? You're sort of driving towards homocysteine instead of methylation. Um, the, it, it's this whole network of, of the sulfur-containing amino acids that are sort of working among themselves doing different things. But the high homocysteine is, a, I think, a definite indicator of sulfate deficiency. And what's happening is that because the sulfation system is not working well with respect to the way sulfate's normally delivered, there's a deficiency in sulfate. And so what happens is that the cholesterol is unsulfated and stuffed into the blood vessels lining the heart. That's how you get the blocked arteries, right? The, the cholesterol is stuffed in there. That's certainly true. That's why they think, you know, high cholesterol is bad. They think you've got to get rid of it in those arteries, but that cholesterol is waiting. It's in, it's suspended waiting. It's like a squirrel putting nuts away, right? It's waiting to become cholesterol sulfate. And there isn't enough sulfate, so it sits there in the in the in the cells. These are immune cells that are into the into the blood vessels, lining the heart, collecting up this cholesterol and waiting for a chance to make cholesterol sulfate. There's not enough sulfate, so they can't do it. But as soon as they can, they will. And the homocysteine then gets you get this inflammation, which is which is needed to make the sulfate from the homocysteine. And it and it depends on uh, vitamin C, and I think. Uh, I forget, there's two critical vitamins that it depends upon to make sulfate from homocysteine. Those vitamins can also be deficient. Um, but then you can make that sulfate and put it onto the cholesterol sulfate on the spot. Uh, because there's insufficient sulfate supply around, you have to make it from the homocysteine. And that's why you need the inflammation. And as soon as you can make it, make the sulfate, you're going to add it to the cholesterol and ship the cholesterol sulfate to the heart. The heart is, is eager to have cholesterol sulfate. It's deficient in cholesterol sulfate. That's what I was going to ask you is how do you make the homocysteine um, to release some sulfur? Because, because like you said, it's not neither homocysteine or cholesterol is evil, that the levels of them being high are just telling you, oh, there's a problem. So how would you go? Why that's, does it... that's the, you know, that's the inflammation. So the inflammation creates oxidizing agents and the oxidizing agents are necessary to oxidize homocysteine to make the sulfate. So right. that's why you have the inflammation is to make the sulfate from the homocysteine. Right. And inflammation is bad because it's causing damage, you know, but that's life, right? You've got to have sulfate. So you're willing, your body's willing to take a chance on it. You'd much rather have the sulfate through a natural means, which is that the liver is making cholesterol sulfate or the skin is making cholesterol sulfate and delivering it everywhere so that there's no problem. You don't need the inflammation. You've already got cholesterol sulfate. The problem is you can't turn cholesterol into cholesterol sulfate because of the blockage of these enzymes by the glyphosate and probably by other things too, but certainly the glyphosate is the one I know about. Oh, okay. No, I was just, I was just sort of unpicking the, because I do see it quite a lot, the high homocysteine, and it's just that there, it, it, it's one of these things that there are different ways for it to go down, and it, and it's just something uh, I was, I'm just curious about of like just maybe so, uh, so it goes up because of inflammation, or um, does inflammation 
occur to try and break it back down again just so i get it. i think the inflammation occurs to try to make sulfate out of homocysteine right okay you need the inflammation to do that so the, so the homocysteine got high first and then the inflammation came later. Yeah. So that comes back to the methyl groups and the methionine cycle because they're obviously tied to homocysteine as well. Yes. In fact, I believe, if I'm going to get this right, homocysteine substitutes in, um, in, in the uh, protein synthesis for methionine, I believe, when methionine is deficient which is really interesting. And then it gets removed. There's processes that are able to repair that, but they make homocysteine thiolactone, which is a modified version of homocysteine. And that's the one that more easily can become sulfate. And that's the one that accumulates to cause, um, to be a, an alarm signal for, for problems with um, heart disease, homocysteine thiolactone, which is a consequence of homocysteine, homocysteine going into the protein instead of methionine, just like glyphosate goes into the protein instead of glycine. Homocysteine is like a, um, an amino acid analog of methionine. I think that's right. Um, yeah, definitely. And then, that, that would be really terrible because methionine and tryptophan, the start and stop codons, sort of a timers as in exactly. crystal. Yes. This is all leading into how cell cycle timing is now going to go off and how having the wrong amino acid in a protein is again affecting this timing mechanism. So that's like really fascinating but but i didn't know you could substitute back out again or does the body just well it's a modification that happens um yeah. i'm trying to think who's the name of this guy uh i'm sorry that i forgot his name but there was a person that i collaborated i, I talked to uh, through email for some time who um who was all into this he's written several papers on homocysteine homocysteine thiolactone and this whole issue of the sulfate he's done all of that i've used his papers as a reference um, keep hoping I'll get his name, but I'm not good with names, but sometimes they pop in because I'm, you know, anyway. Um, so uh, where was I? The homocysteine. So it's very interesting because methionine being deficient uh, causes the homocysteine to take place, take methionine's place in the process of making the protein. And then there's mechanisms that actually recognize that that has happened. And then those mechanisms actually replace the homocysteine, sort of fix the problem. Mm -hmm. but they end up with homocysteine thiolactone. And that's the one that becomes a signaling molecule that says, hey guys, we've got trouble because methionine must be deficient since the homocysteine has substituted. It's an indicator. It's an indirect indicator that methionine is deficient. And methionine is going to be deficient because all that stuff that the gut microbes do to make the methionine is broken by glyphosate. I mean, in fact, it's been shown experimentally that glyphosate suppresses methionine synthesis by microbes and in plants. Both of those have been shown experimentally, which I expect because methionine is synthesized from inorganic sulfur using these enzymes that are suppressed by glyphosate. So that loops so. right back to what you were saying before about how there's way more glyphosate in processed food than people would have guessed because because they just associate it with foliage or plants. So I'm just kind of trying to think, okay, where, how does this problem, where does it come from and how, how could somebody fix it? But like you said, making people aware of the fact that this happens, you can't just take supplements to fix this. It's coming fundamentally. Right from glyphosate from your food or your water so they need to then learn okay wet but where organic you know organic helps a lot luckily us is pretty strong on certified organic we have a lot of options more and more even in regular grocery stores but certainly specialty shops there's a lot of opportunity to get certified organic food it'll cost you considerably more to buy certified organic but i think it's worth it uh, and it's not guaranteed to be glyphosate free they've certainly found glyphosate in organic food but they're not allowed to use glyphosate on those crops. And the testing has certainly shown that on average, the organic foods have a lot less glyphosate. And, um, you know, Zan Hunica tested glyphosate in California wines, a lot of different California wines. I mentioned her earlier, Moms Across America. Um, she found glyphosate in all the wines that she tested, all of them, including the organics, the biodynamics, they all had it, but they had much less than the ones that were regular wines. So, um, so you really need to be careful about wine. Wine and beer are both heavily contaminated with glyphosate. Is, is that only from the US or, because which other countries use glyphosate a lot or is it mainly a U US based sort of farming? Well, product? US uses more than anybody else, but Europe uses quite a bit of glyphosate. Oh, yeah. They don't have the GMO crops the way we do. We, we love GMO. Um, Roundup, you can just buy it and spray it on your patio if you want. Yes, exactly. They don't, people don't have, don't realize it's so toxic. They use it, they kill the dandelions in the lawn while the child is playing. I mean, they don't know that it's toxic. So you have to really not use it. I never use it on my lawn, but I've always been kind of a nutcase against, you know, I don't use insecticides either. So, 
<laughs> if I'm going to kill a roach, I have to kill it by hand, you know, type of thing. <laughs> so. On the subjects of insecticides and uh, pesticides and herbicides, did, um, I know paraquats was what scared people, and obviously DDT is another big one. But what what are your other thoughts on mosquito repellents and well, DDT? Oh yeah, I don't like any of it. Chlorpyrifos is really nasty. Chlorpyrifos is an insecticide that's really nasty. I mean, everything really is bad. Two four D is terrible. Uh, there's a glufosinate, which is a amino acid an analog of glutamate. Glyphosate is an amino acid analog of glycine, and glufosinate glufosinate is an amino acid analog of glutamate. And that one, they're starting to develop GMO crops that are resistant to glufosinate because they're running out of steam on glyphosate. So the weeds are developing lots of resistance. They've had to use more and more. The usage has gone up exponentially over time in the United States, as have all these diseases gone up exponentially in step with glyphosate. I think it's a direct cause and effect relationship. We would be so much healthier if we just got rid of glyphosate. But then if we replace it with something else, who knows what kind of diseases we're going to have, you know? Yeah, that's why I was asking, because no matter what, there's always going to be the demand for these monocultures, because that's the other problem. It's the method of farming, that monocultures are just wide open to problems. But um, no, I just thought that I'd ask about insecticides and things, because in terms of it, with, in, with that, would you say there are anything that for people at home they could use on their lawns or their insects? That's yeah, there's a yeah, I've, I've learned a formula for um, for a weed killer that's a natural weed killer, which is pretty, pretty interesting and very simple you can make it at home and let me see if i can get this right i think it's a gallon of vinegar um a cup of salt and a tablespoon of soap of like dishwasher washer soap you know just uh, soap to wash dishes by hand um so the soap is like a surfactant and then the salt of course is, is toxic to the and you can use that as an herbicide um uh, uh to control weeds uh, i personally I always just pull them out by hand <laughs> yeah. i like to exercise my muscles anyway so it's kind of it's therapeutic right they're out there in the yard i used to pull my dandelions but i now have people help me with that sort of thing but i used to pull my dandelions out by hand in my yard to get rid of them you know i never used any chemicals on my yard my whole life because you can you can eat the dandelions as well because people use they're, well, they're a healthy food but of course they're usually high, highly contaminated with glyphosate because they're being poisoned but intentionally added yeah they're, they're actually really good for renewing the soil as well dandelions all those weeds you know they're really healthy plants for fixing things that they can like marijuana too and you know, um uh what's it called um weed yes. <laughs> is also a really good um crop for rejuvenating the soil Oh yeah, that's a, that's another thing. I suppose um, this on the subject of marijuana, I, do people use um, glyphosate and all sorts in commercial? Because I know in some states it's. I'm really worried about that. To use glyphosate to control the weeds around the marijuana plants, right? Yeah, I suspect. I, I don't. I haven't done enough research to be sure, but I'm pretty sure. I remember a, a news item that I saw. I think it was a 60 Minutes segment on um, this whole big booming marijuana business in California. And people would just nuke everything um, that was there in their yard to get a space to be able to plant the marijuana plants. And that was causing a lot of poisoning of, they would nuke it with glyphosate uh -huh. to kill off everything with glyphosate, start fresh and then plant the marijuana and, and dump the glyphosate into the river waterways to cause toxic effects. And that was that it was a 60 minutes episode on that, on that topic. That, you know, because marijuana has become a big product now because it's becoming legalized everywhere. I suspect that it's a, uh, most of the marijuana, I'm guessing, would be contaminated. I don't know. I don't know for sure. I mean, I haven't measured it or anything, but I'm suspecting. But I think anytime you're going to grow something with plants close together in in under artificial lights in large quantities, you're going to have problems. I know there's a a cannabis fly that is a problem. There's all sorts of things. So no matter what, that you can't just let it grow naturally because you're going to have some kind of pest coming in. So. Yeah, I think it's like you say, the, the, the farming is the issue. And, like, and if we invent a new herbicide, it'll probably be just as bad as glyphosate, but just different. I know there's that worry, although I think glyphosate is uniquely toxic and also insidiously and cumulatively. These are, are features of glyphosate. Glyphosate has a unique mechanism of, of toxicity that nothing else has, as far as I can tell. And that is its ability to substitute for glycine during protein synthesis. This is a theory of mine. I talk a lot about it in my book. I think the evidence is overwhelming, even from Monsanto's own studies. I think the evidence is overwhelming that this is happening. And if it's happening, it explains all these diseases that are going up dramatically, you know, diabetes, obesity, autism. 
uh, cancer, all these things that are going up exactly in step with the rise in glyphosate usage, I can figure out exactly which proteins in many cases would be problematic to cause that disease. And, and you basically connect all the dots from, you know, different sources of information. But also um, deuterium is implicated in diabetes. So if glyphosate and deuterium go hand in hand with people, it would make sense. And it's probably the synergy of the two together that's even worse. Uh, and then again, with a collagen in the body, that's a, like a fascinating structure because it makes electrons and structured water and deuterium is supposed to go in the collagen. It's allowed there. But then I think when you start disrupting your collagen with um glyphosate you, you're really asking for trouble because it's you can raise your redox potential by moving so it's like no matter what we do we know we want to do to improve our health something comes along to spoil it so even the people i know it's uh, so hard it's so hard to avoid all the yeah. landmines in today's world collagen is very interesting in fact i've gotten extremely keenly interested in proline uh, you mm. probably know something about proline um yes about hairpin loops and um pro uh, and beta sheets yes yeah, so, so collagen has a beautiful structure, this sort yeah. of uh, quite, you know, triple helix structure that's really beautiful. And, glyphen, and it has a lot of glycine. Coll collagen has lots of glycine and lots of proline. Way out of whack with the other proteins. Very interesting. It's a very different kind of protein from everything else. You know, lots of glycine, lots of proline. And um, glycine is critical in collagen. Like there are people who have mutations, just a single glycine got mutated to something else. And then the collagen is working terribly. And glyphosate is going to go in there and substitute for those glycines and mess up the triple helix and mess up collagen's beautiful properties and cause a lot of trouble with the joints and the bones. That's why we have so many issues with those, those kinds of problems, you know, hip replacement therapy and knee surgery, all these things that are happening to people, their bones are really in bad shape because the collagen's getting contaminated with glyphosate. It's going into the collagen molecule, but they're really like cool to do with the yeah, helices to do the turns you need the prolines and the glycines for the flex exactly you need them for flexibility as well so uh, yes they're critical for the molecule to perform correctly and now proline is extremely interesting and we don't have the whole story yet but this team of people including laszlo and myself and other really smart people they're working on proline because proline is the only amino acid that's able to secure de deuterium when it gets a deuterium into the proline, it stays. It's very hard to get it out. It's so fascinating. I found a paper from 1943 during World War II, II when they were developing um, the atom bomb. They, were, they learned how to make deuterium rich water to, to, for the atom bomb. And there was a, 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 a thesis, a PhD thesis, 1943, um, that talked about um, deuterium being able, I mean, not uh, proline, as the only amino acid that's able to trap deuterium. It'll, when it gets a deuterium, because it's a constant exchange between hydrogen and deuterium among different molecules in, Does in the body. Does it depend on its neighbor though? In a, are you meaning in a 3D protein structure of proline? Because I know it can form sharp turns. Is it trapping it with, in conjunction with other amino acids or just a proline by itself? A free probably, it, probably in the collagen molecule itself. Yeah. I think it's actually the protein itself that is in, so various proteins, collagen is a good example. Yeah. Um, they're, they're hanging out and then they will periodically pick. And then what there's this enzyme, uh, there's an absolutely fascinating enzyme that's an isomerase that switches proline back and forth between two different ways. It, proline has uh, two different- Oh, oh the hydroxyproline. Well, there's that too. And I, I'm still working on the science to figure all this out because proline can get converted to hydroxyproline. My guess is that that enzyme uh, is going to have, is going to refuse to take it to, to react if there's a deuterium where it wants to pull off the hydrogen. That's my guess that proline. And so the co collagen actually starts with proline and changes it into hydroxyproline with this enzyme. But that enzyme won't change any of the proline molecules that have deuterium there. And then the proline can exchange, There's, and then enzymes that encourage, just isomerases, can, it can encourage proline to switch back and forth between these two. It's a symmetry uh, issue. You know, you can, it's the same exact molecules attached to the same exact, it, it, the whole molecule is the same molecules in the sense that everything is attached to the same place, but there's a swap uh, in the organization of the 3D structure. And which causes a kink. So it, it can either be a straight line for the protein that mess up the protein the way it shapes mm -hmm. and uh, absolutely fascinating. And then so proline can, so this enzyme can make proline freely exchange hydrogen with the water uh, through this back and forth. 
And if it grabs a deuterium, it'll stick. This is what I think. That once it gets deuterium, it, it can't go anymore because that deuterium is going to stop the, pro the enzyme from working because it hangs on to deuterium so well. There was this paper, this 1943 paper. They said they took, they made proline with lots of deuterium in it. And then they soaked it in, in hydrochloric acid for a long time. Like that, hydrochloric acid is a way to break down proteins, right? To, 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 to loosen up those hydrogens and swap them out with the medium. So the water didn't have a lot of deuterium, but the, but the proline molecule had a lot of deuterium on it. And they were thinking that it would exchange with the water and it would lose its deuterium as a consequence of that hydrochloric acid and it didn't do it. So in other words, the proline is really, really good at hanging on to deuterium and the body takes advantage of that. So I think that the collagen molecules are gonna be rich, enriched in deuterium. There was a paper on seals that found out that they had huge, you know, twice as much deuterium in the proline mo molecules at um, proline um, residues in the, in the collagen molecules in the bones of these seals that has super high levels of deuterium. So in other words, I think proline everywhere is trapping deuterium as a, and of course it makes the gelled water as well. The collagen is where the gelled water is. The gel is pushing out protons. The gel actually creates a battery. This is a uh, Gerald Pollock's work, it creates a battery, pushes out pro protons. Those protons are gonna be low in deuterium. I, I'm almost certain that's true because it's the gel is like, it's like the glacier melting. It's the gel melting into the liquid water. It pushes out protons that are depleted in deuterium, enriching the gel with deuterium. And then you have the collagen there ready to trap that deuterium in the, in the collagen molecule through the prolines. It's really amazing. And now I'm finding out that Alzheimer's disease is connected to defects, uh, deficiencies in a, a protein that is one of these isomerases that flips proline back and forth. A deficiency in that enzyme can lead to Alzheimer's disease. So I'm like, whoa, what is that about? So I actually believe that the, um, all the neurodegenerative diseases can be traced back to deuterium problems, I suspect. I'm basically, and of course, cancer works beautifully. And I have done talks on that, various interesting ways about cancer metabolism that's very different from the metabolism of normal cells that can be explained through deuterium toxicity in the cancer cell. It's also relating to the TCA cycle being blocked up, but also the methylene exactly. cycle ties into this dysfunctional metabolism in cancer as well. Isn't it one of the very earliest oncology sort of, because it's stages and that's um, deuterium being there and the methionine cycle messed up is a, just a, a route into cancer. And that's how the deuterium because because it's, it's common knowledge that deuterium and cancer are highly linked because because even right. in, even in Europe deuterium depleted water is yes. a registered treatment for cancer in animals and there yes. are there are lots of studies on it and it correlates perfectly as well if you look at the data yeah some somali s o m l y a i i may not be pronouncing that right mm -hmm. uh, dr somali he's a, a expert he's been work, working on deuterium depleted water as a treatment for cancer for decades. And he's mm -hmm. written a couple of books. And I read his second book, very interesting study where he shows, uh, he basically adds deuterium depleted water to the regimen for these people who are getting various chemotherapy treatments. And he shows that they, um, on average, they live a lot longer. I mean, it really, really seems to help them with the cancer. And can cancer, I think is, um, cancer cells are trying to help the body uh, by producing, for example, lactate that's deuterium depleted mm -hmm. and delivering it to the blood so that the other cells, so the brain can have lactate, which is a good source of deuterium depleted nutrients. Lact of course, lactate, lactose, and milk. So lactate is um, a dairy product and it's going to be low in deuterium. I, mean, I can see why it's low based on how it's made. Um, that becomes, um, the cancer cells are producing nutrients that are useful to the, to the body. And of course they're causing problems because they're growing bigger and pressing on the tissues and wrecking the organ and all that kind of thing. So they're not a, like a good thing, but they are trying to do something that's going to help out, I think, to help solve the deuterium problem. That's really interesting because it, it views cancer rather than this thing that's growing out of control as just an accident. Uh, and, it, and even the cancer cell, you know, because people used to say, oh, it's a group of cells that have decided to be independent and just eat and grow at the expense of the rest of the body. But if it's actually like a, with locked, like Dr. Tom Cowan's work about how disease is just the body sort of trying to tell you something or help you and we need to sort of unpick uh, what it's trying to say and I think what you just said about the cancer cells making lactate is it, it it's like I've not thought of it in that way before yeah I mean of course the mitochondria they often say that the cancer cells have mitochondria that look like they're perfectly fine but they don't use them to make uh, ATP 
they intentionally shut them down. Don't they and do that makes sense. Metabolism. One yeah, thing. exactly. That's so interesting. The cancer metabolism. I've read a lot about that and it, it totally makes sense to me. Um, their mitochondria are too loaded with deuterium. So they know in a sense, I think of them as little, having little brains, you know, they, they know that if they use their mitochondria, they're going to be in trouble because they're going to cause DNA damage, which they've already got a problem with that. So they want to shut down their mitochondria in, in order to be able to live longer, you know, to not get killed by the DNA damage. Uh, they need to shut down their mitochondria. So instead they make lots and lots of lactate out of glucose and that's how they get their ATP. They, 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 love, they love glucose, they eat lots of sugar, turn it into lactate, ship that out, to the world so the whole organism can benefit from the lactate that they're making, which is really healthy deuterium depleted food, which is part of why uh, fermented foods are good, by the way, because there's lactate, you know, for example, fermented dairy products mm -hmm. um, have a lot of lactate. Um, so that's another thing, but the, the methyls, I wanted to get back to the methyls on the DNA, because that's also pretty fascinating and connected to outside, to, uh, to cancer. You probably know that uh, cancer cells have a generic hypomethylation problem on their DNA. Their DNA is, has, doesn't have enough methyls on it uh, in cancer. They can have methylated DNA at the controlled elements of various um, oncogenes, but they, in general, their methylation is low compared to normal cells. So that means many, they can just express whatever they like genetically. It's, it's not- Yeah, yeah, it, it, yeah methylation uh, often suppresses, right? The activity. Yes, yeah. So it's uh, it's basically um, like train, you know, it's basically uh, every all tracks are open. If I'm just more for the listeners um, about mm -hmm. so generally methylation is off. And then just to keep it simple, when it's unmethylated, it's on. Right. So but the thing is, I suspect that the, the reason that DNA, a reason why DNA is methylated, you know, that there's a lot of signaling involved with DNA methylation. But a reason I suspect is to provide those methyls to the mitochondria. So if you think about the mitochondrial DNA, with these methyls attached to it. And then the big question is how do those methyls get off? I was very interested in that question. How do they get off? Is there a, an enzyme that picks them off and maybe makes, I don't know what it makes, maybe attaches them to something else. At some point, what happens? Does the methyl ever get metabolized is the question, right? And it's really, really fascinating because there's an enzyme um, and I'm not gonna remember its name, something like PET, I forget. <laughs> there's an enzyme in uh, that uh, takes the methyls uh, in the DNA, while the DNA still has the methyls attached to it, it's still DNA, this enzyme uh, turns the methyls one by one into other molecules that are taking the protons off one by one. So this enzyme, TET, I think it is, TET, and it has a very weird thing that it stands for that I won't remember. <laughs> um, this enzyme, it takes the methyls off by taking off the protons one by one off of the methyl. So the methyl becomes formal, formal uh, DNA and then... Um, from, from, so it's basically becomes methyl, um, <laughs> methyl, uh, methanol, formaldehyde, and formate. It's becoming these other, um, it, it gradually is pulling the H's off and putting oxygens on to the point where it finally becomes carbon dioxide. So the methyl slowly disappears off of the DNA by virtue of picking off those hydrogens and that uses those hydrogens to make succinate out of alpha ketoglutarate, which is truly amazing. So it's actually making succinate uh, from those hydrogens that were on those methyls that were attached to that DNA. That succinate is gonna have really low deuterium in those two hydrogen atoms, which are super important because the succinate is critical in the mitochondria for providing protons to the mitochondrial intermembrane space. Succinate, succinate dehydrogenase is the only enzyme. It's a complex two enzyme. It's the only enzyme in the mitochondria that participates in both citric acid cycle, which is turning uh, nutrients into carbon dioxide and water, and the electron transport chain, which is what's driving the ATP synthesis. So succinate dehydrogenase is a super important dehydrogenase enzyme in the mitochondria that is in fact suppressed by glyphosate. That's been shown in multiple studies. Suppression of that enzyme is associated with many cancers. Um, succinate itself is then a very important nutrient because it can feed into the mitochondria to provide those protons. And then those DNA methyl groups actually give that succinate two beautiful protons that are 80% depleted in, in, pro, in deuterium because of coming all the way back to that hydrogen gas that the microbes made. It's just absolutely amazing. Do you well, follow that? <laughs> it's a I'm, really, I'm really fascinated in energy systems in the body that doesn't involve food. So you've now just told me another one. So so just to sort of summarize it, that the um you can pull hydrogens off methyl groups in DNA and and feed it into 
the mitochondria to power the ATPase or kind of exactly. it. So, so this thing that I'm really into about alternative energy sources, and you've just highlighted one, because obviously if, if our body senses a low energy, I'm not going to go into it. It causes all sorts of issues. So I'm always looking for these new energy systems. So you've just provided like an absolute gem. Um, yes. And I think j just because I um, asked a question about the cancer cells. So did you say the cancer cells, their DNA is unmethylated or more methylated? Well, it's complicated because there are some things where they're more and some things where they're less, but on average, they have fewer methyls um, than yeah. uh, normal cells, fewer. I and I think it's because they've actually burned up their methyls to help with their mitochondrial problem because they have too much deuterium. So they get, oh, these methyls, these are great. These have got low deuterium let me go feed them into the mitochondria and you deplete them so it, it, it's a the dna is actually storing storing valuable methyl groups for the cell to be there in, for an emergency once you've said oh my god my mitochondria are really sick i need some more you know good stuff mm. let me steal some methyls from the from the dna to help solve the de deuterium problem and then of course i get the hypomethylated dna which is an indicator that i have a deuterium problem so you have all these things that happen as a consequence of your deuterium problem where your, your cell is trying to find a different way to provide good protons to the, to the mitochondria. And each of those ways leaves behind some kind of signal that's saying, hey, guys, you've got a problem. And then, and then there's ways to react to that and things carry forth. So it's like really complicated alternative approaches to a problem, trying to get around the problem by doing it a different way. Yeah, well, I think that's the, one of the most interesting things I've heard for weeks about pulling hydrogen off methyl groups in DNA to put into the mitochondria, because I'm always interested in, you know, where does the body get extra electrons from and where does it steal protons or not steal or get them from? Because like deuterium and, and electrons and um, protons are what makes the world go round. So it, there's more there's much more to this story, I'd imagine, as well. But I think yes, it's really interesting. And I wanted to say something about supplements too, because the methyl groups, there are many valuable supplements that have methyl groups on them. And a lot of people are taking these supplements and most of the supplements are made in the chemistry lab, yeah. which means that they won't have high quality methyls. They'll have fake methyls that have too much deuterium in them. And, and, and I can name some of them. Methionine, of course, is one of them. You take the methionine supplement. And in fact, I was really interested. I, I remember reading some time ago, the first time about methionine deficiency being a, a, a way to get long, longevity. Have you heard about that? Oh yeah, definitely. It's that's this to do with mTOR and um, I, I have heard of it, but the thing is it's, um, I'll just let you carry on, but yes, 100%, because this is where people argue about should you be vegan or should you be um, keto uh, for longevity? So that's where the methionine, I've heard the methionine argument, like obviously people who are vegetarian or vegan because there's less of it in exactly. um, but in those products. So yes, I've heard the the discussion, but I'm interested in what you want to say. Yeah, so, so when I first heard about it, I'm like, this is crazy because I know methionine is so essential for everything and how could it possibly be a good idea to have less, right? How could it possibly be good? I was like, this doesn't make any sense to me. And yeah. I sort of dismissed it. Recently, I went back to it and I found a paper. It's just like so interesting to me because I think I'm right on this. It was one of these, you know, brainstorming insights that I, I have many of these these days because everything makes so much more sense when you look at deuterium. But they had, so I, I found this study on these rats and they were looking at the methionine issue. They didn't want, because they had heard, they, they were aware, you know, and they wanted to see what would happen to these rats. And so they, they gave them a synthetic diet, basically. Their food was all these amino acids that were made in the chemistry lab. And then they, they could control how much of each amino acid they gave them. And so they had the control group that got enough methionine. And then they had the deficient group where they just gave them less of the methionine from the mix of amino acids from the chemistry lab, right? So that methionine is, is bad methionine because it's not hasn't been made properly. It doesn't have the low deuterium. That's the big thing about methionine. It doesn't have it. So when they gave them less methionine, what I think happened was that their microbes had to take over to make methionine because it was deficient. They were driven to make it and they made it a good way. They got the hydrogen gas and they turned it into methane and made the methionine. They had good methionine that had the methyl groups that were healthy, whereas the methionine they're getting from the external sources is, is bad stuff. So the methyl groups were being populated throughout all the mitochondria of these, um, of these rats with this high deuterium in it because of this methionine source and that was causing them to age faster the ones that were getting the methionine they were basically getting a toxic form of methionine whereas the ones that had were deficient they were able to make it to make up for the deficiency by making it in in, in the gut microbiome and then this paper showed specifically mitochondrial problems mi mitochondrial oxidative damage 
you know, they showed in mitochondrial dysfunction, they showed exactly what you would expect with too much deuterium in the mitochondria happening to the, the, um, the rats that had too much methionine. They got external source of methionine. They populated their, their DNA with these bad methyls that had lots of deuterium in them and they wrecked their mitochondria. So I think that's the answer. I was really puzzled when I first read that. You just can't imagine that a deficiency in the essential amino acid would be a good idea, you know? I know, but, but you also- force microbes to make it. One bad study, people can then um, take it and, and it goes viral on social media and then people believe it. Whereas if you unpick it, saying that this is not based on an observation, we've engineered an experiment and we've engineered amino acids to give to something. So therefore, it's, our, our results are a product of us engineering it. And if you just leave your body alone, like the rats that didn't have the methionine given to them, they had to make it themselves. And if we can make it, we shouldn't take it. So exactly, yes, it, it's always you have to like a lot of these studies are you have to like read in massive detail and sort of think out out of the box to unpick them. But that that but makes the studies the studies never pay any attention to the fact that it's synthetic instead of natural. They have no clue that that's a problem. They don't even know that that should be something they should be worried about. And in order to do this study, they had to give them synthetics because they had to be able to control how much methionine they got. So they were getting their amino acids from these synthetic products. All of their amino acids were messed up because I think a lot of them have low deuterium when they're made naturally. You know, and so I, I just think I've seen many papers where they talk about fats and different kinds of fats and what kind of problems they have. And they need to look at how much glyphosate is in those fats in order to figure out how how good they are for the person or not, because nobody looks at how much glyphosate there is. But you could have two fats that you study, and one of them has a lot of glyphosate, the other one doesn't. The one that's going to win is the one without the glyphosate, but it's not because of the fat itself that's the problem, it's, it's the glyphosate. So we're, they're really messing up. All these experiments, they get contradictory results in different studies because they're not paying attention to how much glyphosate is in it. That's the whole, that's the big issue with these foods, and they're not, they're ignoring it. So all these studies are bogus, you know? But with the, with the supplements, you've got, for example, choline. Right? Choline is something people think they should take as a supplement. It's another one of those things that's animal-based foods, right? Animal-based foods have a lot of choline. Take choline by tartrate, but you can get choline from lectins, but I think they're all right. Are you meaning choline as in- Right, as long as it's natural, as long yeah. as it's natural. But if it's synthetically made, don't take it because it, choline has three methyls and they come from methionine. As attached to the nitrogen atom are three methyls. All three of those methyls are golden. They're golden methyls if they came naturally. But if they're synthetic, they're not. And so if you take a whole bunch of synthetic choline, you're not going to do well by that, you know? And the same thing with a melatonin. Lots of people take melatonin to sleep. And melatonin has been a lot of hype around melatonin being a fantastic molecule, right? You've probably heard about that for various things. Melatonin is very interesting because you start with tryptophan and tryptophan is a product of the shikimate pathway, which glyphosate famously disrupts. So you've got already a tryptophan deficiency problem if you're getting exposed to glyphosate because your microbes are not able to make the tryptophan. Tryptophan becomes serotonin with some processing and that's a, a neurotransmitter, serotonin. That's also very important for the brain. Uh, serotonin deficiency causes violent behavior and depression. You know, so serotonin is very important. Serotonin gets converted to melatonin in the brain in two steps, it adds an acetyl group on one side and the methyl group on the other side. And both the acetyl and the methyl are gonna be low in deuterium if they came to it properly through natural mechanisms. A low deuterium acetyl and a low deuterium, and acetyl has a methyl on it too. So that's two methyls that are low in deuterium that are added to the serotonin to make the melatonin. And then melatonin is delivering these wonderful low deuterium nutrients to the brain while you sleep. And they're critical for the activities that the brain does during sleep. So. Melatonin, of course, is a very important uh, sleep aid. But if you take melatonin as a supplement, it's probably synthetic and it's probably not good. Absolutely. And also melatonin repairs mitochondria and it also does autophagy and apoptosis and controls sex hormones. So t taking something, goodness knows in what dose or what's in it is just foolish. Right. It'll mess up your melatonin, natural melatonin system. But the thing is that those methyls, so that I, I followed, I, I followed the melatonin processing in, in the cells. It's hard to find the literature to actually tell you exactly what happens to that methyl on the melatonin molecule, but it's the same thing as the DNA. It, it, the protons get taken off one by one and delivered to the mitochondria. In the meth, when you metabolize the melatonin in the mitochondria, 
those methyls are providing low deuterium protons to the mitochondria. Yeah, that's a whole other angle, because I suppose I think about things in my own way. And then you're talking about another side of the story, the methyl groups, again, not just being sort of tags, but this thing you can break down, take protons off and feed into, because that would tie into, well, how does melatonin help the mitochondria? Because Exactly, that's how. Say, oh, yeah. yes, melatonin helps and repairs the mitochondria. But now you've said, well, this is a possible mechanism by which, because it's- Exactly. Yeah. More protons. And if you've got more protons, you've got more power to, uh, proton gradient uh, to, to make ATP. So it, like, it's like no matter who I speak to, there's always uh, some person thinks, oh, I've solved it all. And then you come along with a whole <laughs> fresh idea. But then now it gets me thinking about, you know, where are methyl groups? And I think it, exactly. It, and when you start to realize that, you see how the story just becomes so much clearer. You know, I always was so puzzled by reactions and I was aware of this like cholesterol there's a special escort protein that gets cholesterol inside the mitochondria and then there's some enzymes that modify the cholesterol inside the mitochondria and then the modified cholesterol has to get out of the mitochondria and then some more things happen in the cytoplasm I'm like why does a cell go through all this complexity to ship the cholesterol it's hard ship the cholesterol in ship the enzyme in do the thing in the mitochondria and then get get them back out again it's a lot of extra steps why can't you just do it all in the cytoplasm you know and so I've been puzzled by that for a long time, but now I know the answer because everything that happens inside the mitochondria is delivering deuterium depleted protons to the mitochondria. That's the goal of all these reactions, including all the neurotransmitters. When they get metabolized, they're doing that too. So it's why I'm so excited because all these things start to make so much sense all of a sudden, even things that I was very puzzled about before they start to make sense when you look at deuterium as the problem. What about um, using methyl groups to put on estrogen or toxins? Because why would the body waste such a precious uh, methyl group? Or, or is that just part of they have a, um, an amount of methyl groups allocated for removing toxins and then they have another set? Which yeah, I don't know. But that's a good point because methylation is one way to remove toxins. Sulfation is another one. Yeah. You know, sort of attaching these things to the toxins to help to uh, often to help solubilize them so they can be excreted through the urine. Uh, it's a good question whether there's ever an opportunity to whether the kidneys might might grab that methyl before they mm. ship it out right they could like it could be the methyl it comes in methylated to the kidneys and the kidneys are about to ditch it into the urine and they say well let me grab that methyl first and then i'll let go of it <laughs> it's possible right i don't That's know I i'm just speaking is. off the top of my head yeah but the thing is it might have an opportunity to take that methyl and use it yeah, so back to the amino acids, because people like using amino acids as supplements. And you mentioned methionine being bad, but would you say that any amino acid made in a lab is a bad idea just from a deuterium perspective? And then back. I think so. Yes. I know glycine. Glycine has low deuterium and serine has low deuterium and methionine has low deuterium. I know this for a fact among those. And I haven't checked out all the others. I think that leucine, isoleucine would have low deuterium. I'm just in looking from how they're made. You have to kind of go back and look at how the, how the microbes make these molecules. It's not easy. And you have to see what the sources are that went into making it. And, um, and, so, and then if those sources can be traced back to the hydrogen gas, that's, that's the game. There's a really big uh, effort in the gut to grab the hydrogen gas, make the methane. And I mentioned about the cows releasing all that methane and causing yeah, yeah. global climate change. That's because the cows are poisoned by glyphosate. Normally they would have released, I believe they would have released a lot less methane because the methane backs up because the enzymes aren't working. Those dehydrogenases are suppressed by glyphosate. I saw a paper on E. coli. They had a dozen different dehydrogenases that they, they found were suppressed by glyphosate. And I know why, because they have what I call a glyphosate susceptibility motif, which is a particular sequence in the amino acid sequence that has a glycine that's very susceptible to glyphosate substitution. And if you substitute it, you'll ruin that protein. You won't be able to bind phosphate, which is a huge problem for these enzymes that are involved with deuterium management. So I think a lot of those enzymes are getting messed up by glyphosate and then that's stalling the system. And so actually you get formaldehyde toxicity as well. You get methane gas getting in the cows, right? Methane gas gets released and then the formaldehyde gets stalled too because the formaldehyde dehydrogenase is broken by glyphosate. Uh, th that same study showed that an enzyme that detoxes formaldehyde, detoxifies formaldehyde by combining it to glutathione, and then there's an enzyme that can react to that glutathional formaldehyde <laughs> to take it apart. That enzyme gets highly, highly upregulated in response to glyphosate in the E. coli bacteria. And that makes sense because the formaldehyde is piling up because the formaldehyde dehydrogenase is broken. And then that formaldehyde is, is a carcinogen, you know. It, it's nasty stuff.
and, and the gut microbes make it, but they usually can break it down really fast because they have this very active enzyme that can clear it and they need to make it because that's part of this process of grabbing those protons to, to be uh, delivered to the mitochondria. Yeah, so the thing is, if it's really difficult biologically to make amino acids, it, when people try and make them in a lab, we're just going to take shortcuts and make deuterium loaded things by accident. Because like you keep saying, and I completely agree, biology inside us has set up all these intricate methods to keep the deuterium where it belongs and out of the mitochondria and that kind of i like i think just for the last thing on the supplements what about supplements that, not choline but say methylated b vitamins that people buy is that the same problem you're buying a b i suspect so you have to go back and look at this patent for how to make it because I've, I've been trying to rummage through patents on the web to see exactly how they make these supplements. But I think most of these supplements are made in the chemistry lab, because if you picture trying to, you know, like you grow some microbes in a culture, right? Like oh, say yes, E. coli, and then to have to harvest, uh, purify and harvest. There's a, I mean, a lot of stuff in there you don't want to put in, right? You want to have a pure chemical glycine, for example. So you make the glycine in the chemistry lab and that way you can really kind of control getting a concentrated supply of glycine without a whole bunch of other stuff in there. But if you have a biological system mm -hmm. that's making the glycine, now you've got a big problem with how to isolate the glycine. That's why I don't take any supplements. I don't take any of these supplements that are um, organic molecules, none. No, no, I um, stopped ages ago. And I think it's a kind of, I'm interested. I suppose I was just thinking about methyl groups with the deuterium in them, whether they could actually end up on a DNA molecule um, or whether the, it'll get broken. Say if you took in an artificial methyl group with the deuterium, would our bodies or the gut bacteria break, break it down and use it? Or would the methyl group remain intact in some way? That's what I'm kind of asking. With yeah, that's a good question to ask. And I've wondered about that myself. Like is, is the gut, uh, are the gut microbiome smart enough to realize that this is not a good methyl? We don't want this one. Yeah. And therefore, let's just kind of dispose of it now before it gets into the host. Like, I think they're very good at trying to keep their host healthy. They need a healthy host in order to live, right? So they care about that. But it's possible that they are able to distinguish the methyls um, that are good versus the ones that are bad. There's a what trimethylamine oxide. Have you heard of that, TMAO? Yes, yes. People have big methyls about this on the internet a lot. That's a complicated one, trimethylamine oxide. I have wondered whether that's a uh, basically a choline molecule that was uh, unable to get converted because the enzymes that, uh, that do these reactions that pull those protons off, many of them have the ability to notice that it's deuterium and not take it. So if you picture trimethylamine oxide coming from choline, synthetic choline that has these three methyls, but they're all bad because they're not, they haven't been made naturally. And so then the enzymes that would normally metabolize those methyls and disappear them are not willing to accept them because they've got deuterium. Mm. And then the trimethylamine oxide survives in the gut, trimethylamine, and then it gets oxidized in the liver. And then TMAO in the blood, I believe is bad news, right? There's, mm. there's evidence of harm from TMAO in the blood. And it may be an indicator of, of supplementing with choline that is uh, defective because it's synthetic. Yeah, that's that's really interesting because always with people and I've done it, you know, you do stupid things in the past. And as long as it's more about if people stop doing something, they'll just get better because people are probably thinking, oh, no, I've taken loads of supplements. But it's like, OK, it doesn't matter. Just stop doing it and it should be OK. That's why I do th agree with you that, that the gut microbiome could well filter these methyl groups. They, with a the deuterium, it's like the same as any other deuterium problem. I was just thinking about deuterium in molecules and how well our bodies can deal with them. The other thing I wanted to ask you is, is uh, um, you know, with minerals in our body, why does the body excrete them? Whereas it would just make more sense to keep, you know, any mineral and just const you know i know that it's all based on redox reactions and redox potential and passing electrons around so why do you have to let the mineral out can't what why can't we keep minerals in our bodies and it doesn't matter if you don't know the answer it's just been something that i mm. mean all ele electronic devices just continuously pass electrons through it but what why do humans let the minerals out why do we need fresh iron or fresh copper because it's yes the, that's the a good point why can't we just keep the copper we have and use yeah. it forever right, without getting rid of it or, or, I have the a, or whatever because i know you know a lot about minerals and it doesn't matter yes. 
it's just more something I've been, you know, I just asked, thought I'd ask you because yeah. you know a lot. I think it's just a matter of uh, having a poor management system because I think we do actually try to save the minerals as much as possible. We have all these ionophores, that, for example, that trap iron and then they can trans safely transport iron. All of these minerals are both toxic and deficient at the same time, especially yeah. in the context of glyphosate because glyphosate chelates them and keeps them away, for example, from the microbes. The microbes become deficient. But then glyphosate can, for example, bind to aluminum and take it to the brain and then deliver it in the acidic environment of the terminal watershed of the blood. So then when the, when the pH goes down, glyphosate lets go of the aluminum and then the aluminum becomes toxic as well as the glyphosate. So glyphosate is, uh, is a metal chelator and we have natural chelators that help us to move these metals around. You need to, it's sort of like transporting oxygen, right? You have oxygen in the big tank, very strong, uh, metal to keep the oxygen from exploding because then it'll, it'll cause a fire. I mean, oxygen is highly explosive, so it's very dangerous to transport it. So all of these minerals are, can be dangerous in the wrong place, but yet they need to be uh, delivered to the protons that want, to the proteins that want to use them as a catalyst. Mm -hmm. They need to be delivered to them in some way that keeps them from damaging the surrounding environment. So it's a very tricky thing to move them around and probably um, they get into a situation where they're going to be toxic and the kidneys just get rid of them because they can't figure out how to find a safe way to transport them. That or, would be my or do you think they're partly bound to something else? Because on the subject of hormones and neurotransmitters, I can understand why we just keep recycling the same one. And also from what you've said about pinching um, hydrogens off methyl groups to use as energy, you, I can understand that cycle because you need uh, hormones and neurotransmitters at different times of the day. But then with the metals, uh, maybe that um, the glyphosate is chelating them and, and dumping them so that they- Well, that's true too. A chelator like glyphosate will simply trap the metal and then the, the urine dumps the glyphosate with the metal. So it could be that they're being trapped by chelators like glyphosate that are, in fact, that'll happen when you take these uh, chelators like EDTA to try to get rid of some of aluminum or something or mercury. Um, you can lose uh, minerals that way and become deficient in, in critical minerals as a consequence of this chelator grabbing it. So probably glyphosate is a major player. I'm, thank, I'm glad you brought that up in causing us to lose minerals because mm -hmm. it binds so tightly to the glyphosate and just gets shipped out with the glyphosate. Because I guess I that's right. With our ancestors and, you know, though we had food was less abundant uh, and they managed yet nowadays we've got access yeah. to supplements and people I know take so much of all these minerals and they still either the body rejects them all or they still present with mineral imbalances yet our ancestors had you know yes yeah, I that's agree a good that point. We've got less sort of magnesium in the soil and such like but it just seems to me where's it going and why is the body chucking out minerals and then letting the person become deficient but I think what you've said about the glyphosate participating in this that would make sense as well that would uh, for sure yeah and of course um, there's also issues of absorption across the gut so lots of times it just comes in and goes out without ever getting out of the gut uh, because of absorption absorption issues yeah that's a bit like the vitamin b12 problem the, the cobalamin that there's something wrong with the gut like it's too slippery everything seems to be just going through that's interesting yeah that's a good point <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but, but yes. So so anyway, like we've gone longer than than than, than it's. Uh, I, I can't believe we've gone for uh, almost two hours. I know. Like I had, I had a bit of time dilation because because obviously I want I need to go to bed, but then I got. So <laughs> Where are you? Oh, I'm I'm in the UK. Okay, that's what I thought. Yeah, I so actually live like um five nine, I, almost ten o'clock, right? Yeah, almost yeah. I live about yeah. five minutes away from Glen Wayne, right? So oh, that's so fun. That's right. I had forgotten that. That's wonderful. Say hi to him for me. He and yeah, I had a well, lot of I'll a lot of fun working together. Yes, I know because he's got a. I know you and him did some work on sulfate together, and also I did. He did an amazing interview with me years ago on cholesterol, which I'm going to re-upload because you know how some videos are timeless. Yes. Yes, I think he so. Really He's is. great. He and I gave a uh, talk. We, we both gave talks at Western Price Foundation together, side by side. It worked out really nice. He did a great job. He, he's yeah. a great ad advocate for the same things that I talk about. So that's wonderful. And also he it's I will because people now have mentioned it, but upload his video because he's like done the presentation that many times. It, it's really slick. 
um, and he talks about the postal systems. But I think it's a really good route in for people who are new to yes. it because this is like a really high level podcast. And not not that it's you know not accessible to everybody, but I think you know, and sometimes people need to say, well, that was interesting. Where can I find the beginning of this story? I know that's true. It's hard to jump into the middle because there's so much stuff and it. it's so uh, complicated. Yeah, and that's... we still I don't understand all of it either. I have many questions that I'm still trying to answer. So what about deuterium? Because I'm always I'm really interested in the light show and deuterium and because uh, it's in the cerebral spinal fluid as well. Uh, and if you if you squash it, it can produce light. And also the the way red light and blue light influence deuterium mm -hmm. behavior. But what you said about the structured water or the gel water because that obviously structures better in the presence of infrared and red light that would make mm -hmm. sense of how that's right so it, it it pulls the deuterium in so it can't go where it shouldn't so that's in my brain i can understand because i don't if someone just tells me oh blue light makes deuterium go in and red makes it not bad you need i, I want to know well why i don't know i know if you know why you can remember it better right yeah, I find that so, too. Yeah, I just don't accept just anymore. But I think what you just said about what you were talking a lot about with the so people can um, be reminded about the the gel water and how the deuterium belongs in there because it stiffens it within reason. And again, red lights and you know sunlight and saunas and heat help with the deuterium be you know behaving properly so that's kind of answered my question about the red light and the deuterium because i've been puzzling about it how, now how does the blue light make it, it the problem worse i'll have to look into that myself but mm -hmm. I, I really appreciate everything you've said today because you've kind of um give, given like sort of eureka moments or you know when you know when yeah. you're trying to work something out and somebody else will bring a piece to the table and it's like a hi i get it all right that's what's been fun for me with all these great people that i'm working with is they're all very smart and they're all looking at different things different ways and so they'll they'll put something in there like oh wow i didn't think of that mm. oh what's the implication of that i gotta go read some papers you know it's just like you get all excited I, it's really been a thrill ride a thrill ride for me Oh, yeah, definitely. Because um, for people listening, you've got more books, haven't you? Because the Toxic Legacy is the big read, but then there's the book on autism. But is, is there a third yes. book? I wish there were, but I want to do one on deuterium um, if I can get uh, a publisher interested. Uh, I think the, the publisher that published my book was reluctant to go, to go there because they thought uh, it's too much science and most people don't aren't interested. So I was frustrated because I think it's an incredible story, but... Um, I tried with them and they, they turned it down. So right now I'm just, I'm so busy with writing papers. I want to get some papers out on deuterium. I don't have any yet. It's just, I don't know where to start because there's such a huge gap between what I know and what the mainstream is willing to entertain that it's just very difficult to figure out where to start, what to write, you know, to get it passed through the review process. It's very difficult. Okay. But I'm hoping to do that. And I've got collaborators that are really smart. So we're, we want to turn out some papers on deuterium, but we, haven't gotten, haven't figured out how to do that yet. So maybe some papers on deuterium. And then if I can live long enough, a book on deuterium would be wonderful. I'd love to do that. Oh, that would be great. And then in the meantime, we can read the autism book and the toxic legacy. Mm -hmm. Cindy and Erica's obsession. It's a novel, actually. Yes. The other one. Yeah. Oh no! So no, people should support you with you by, because you you give so much by sharing information. Because lots of scientists just don't; they just live in another planet. Whereas you come out and do podcasts and share it all. And I think, like we've talked about before, sharing information is so important. And finding sort of top scientists like yourself that do share. Because I can't imagine my PhD supervisor ever agreeing to come on my YouTube or anybody's YouTube yeah. channel. Ever. I mean, a lot. Yeah, a lot of people want to hold the idea to themselves and I'm absolutely free to tell anybody anything that I know uh, because I, I want the ideas to get out there I don't care about the personal glory that I might get by being the one who you know let somebody else steal it and run with it I'd be very happy yeah, I, I think it's also some you're very good at explaining things that we can understand, whereas some scientists, I just think they wouldn't be able to do a podcast because it would be too difficult for the general. I'm glad you said that about me. I fear that I'm often in that boat as well, that I'm kind of talking over people's heads, assuming they know too much. But people will slowly I think if people get interested, then they're willing to start learning and you can certainly learn. You don't need a teacher. Just get on the Web and start reading papers. It's it, To me, it feels like something you can do if you're motivated enough you know you can self-educate on these oh, things oh definitely and I, and I think even if somebody gets like 
um, 10 points or five points out of this, even just there's glyphosate in processed food, not just plants or just any one thing. It can be sort of really helpful and somebody might never have heard of glyphosate. So, you know, it's it's always worth um, kind of bringing up the subject again and again. Otherwise, if we don't talk about it, then they get away with the glyphosate. So, you know, the more people that hear the word over and over, the, the better. Yes, I think so. Okay. Well, anyway, well, thank you so much for your time. Much. And really enjoyed. This it was a great conversation. I really enjoyed it. And thank, thank you for being willing to get into some of the deep science. It's, it's great. Thank you very much for watching. I've just started a new Substack, and this is where I'll put all of my long form content on quantum biology. And there are posts already there. The links are in the description. I just want to thank my sponsor, Lightwater, again one more time it's been a massive help for me uh, to be able to make this channel better for you and to get more guests and to make more content so there's a lot more coming your way very soon thank you goodbye <laughs>